Hello, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, I'm Dr. Kristen Burton, coming to you all from the National World War II Museum Distance Learning Studio, and we are very excited today to have author Sharon Cameron joining us in observance of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, a little background on Sharon Cameron. Number one New York Times bestselling author of several books, including The Dark Unwinding, A Spark Unseen, Rook, The Forgetting, The Knowing, and today she's here to talk to us about her book, The Light in Hidden Places, all from Scholastic Press. Now, Sharon Cameron has won a number of awards, including the Parents' Choice Gold Award, the Westchester Fiction Award, and has been chosen for numerous lists, including Indie Next Top 10, the YALSA's Best Fiction for Young Adults, and Audible Best Books. Uh, the Light in Hidden Places is now sold in 15 foreign countries, including Poland, Israel, and Germany. And with that, we will hand it over to Sharon Cameron. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It always uh, is so funny to hear um, those bios read, you know, out and hear all those things put together. Um, it doesn't really quite feel like that on, on my end, but thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm so glad to be here today uh, with you guys, especially during this week, uh, during um, International Holocaust uh, Remembrance. It is, um, a, it's, it's a special time. Um, it is a time that, you um, has meant a lot uh, to me personally, especially um, these these past few years. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit more about that and and why it's special to me. But I think before I do that, I'll tell you just a little bit um, about myself um, as far as being a writer. I kind of consider myself a little bit of an accidental writer. Um, at some point it was an accident I worked really hard to make happen, um, but I had a whole nother career before writing. I was a musician um, for many years. I was a classical pianist and I thought that's what I would do with my whole life. I was perfectly happy doing that and I still love music, um, but I really thought that was the path, you know, my life was going to take. But, you know, it's funny how little things um, can pop up in your life and they can just change everything. And for me, who was always a huge reader and a huge history buff, um, it was coming across a, a little piece of um, rare and vague um, Scottish history um, from the 1740s um, that just absolutely lit my fire um, to the point where I met the descendants, I went to the places, I researched. This was kind of before you could Google everyone. So uh, me and my local library and interlibrary loan were like best friends like, like this. And one day while I was just in this fever of excitement over this little piece of history and researching it, I walked past my computer with 45 minutes to spare. And I thought, huh, what would it even be like? to write a first chapter about something like this? What, what, what would it be like if there was a book about this? And so I sat down on a whim and I wrote for the very first time in my life for 45 minutes. And I promise you, I'm not exaggerating when I say I got up and I decided to completely change my life. And that's what I did because I loved writing so, so much. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen with you now, if I can make sure that I do it correctly. And the, you know, writing became everything to me. And here are the books um, that you can see that, that I have written that still feel quite surprising <laughs> to me. Um, so being here feels surprising. It feels surprising to say, this is what I'm doing. But let me take you back. Now that you can see kind of where I went to, let me take you back to a long time before um, I ever had even thought about being a writer. And another little small thing happened that shouldn't have been anything. Um, it shouldn't have been a big deal at all. I walked through my living room and I turned on the television and this woman was on my screen. And she said five words and those five words completely changed my life. And those five words were, 
My name is Stefania Podgorska. And I sat down on the couch and I listened to this woman, Stefania Podgorska, tell me about her life. And it was Holocaust Remembrance Week, just like it is right now um, when this was happening. That's why her interview and her oral history was even being aired. And so I sat down, ignored everything else that I was supposed to be doing, and I let her tell me about what it was like to be a 13 year old girl in sort of the backwaters of Poland, a very small village. She lived on a farm um, with the rest of her brothers and sisters. There were eight of them. It was a big, busy family, um, but she did not want to live on a farm. She didn't, she didn't love that life. Um, and at 13, she convinced her mother to let her move to the big city of Shemish, Poland. Now, this is a map that shows you Poland the way it used to look before World War II. And you can see where Shemish is down there at the bottom. And that is how you pronounce that word, Shemish. And Shemish was also pretty much in the backwaters of Poland. Um, it was not a big place, but to Stefania, it was a big place. And she really loved it there. She loved the busyness and the comings and the goings. And she found a job in a little grocery store run by a Jewish family named the Diamonds. Now, I should probably tell you that um, Stefania is Catholic and the Diamonds are Jewish. Now, this is their, this is their third son, Max Diamant, um, standing in front of the grocery store where Stefania worked. So in Shemesh at this time before World War II, even though the population was maybe half Catholic, Christian, half Jewish, um, these two groups did not mix socially um, much at all. They really kept to their separate groups. So for her to be working as a Catholic for a Jewish family was not a very usual uh, situation. But then again, Stefania Pedgorska was not a very usual girl. And, you know, I listened to her tell me this story about when she first went to work for this family in the grocery store and how she got sent on an errand to the market uh, to buy something that they were going to then resell in the store. And so she was wandering around the market looking for a bargain and a fight broke out on the street. And the fight was between two little boys, maybe nine, 10 years old, and they were they were just going at it and a crowd gathered around and Stefania was one of that crowd. And the fight had started because one boy had called the other boy a dirty Jew. And the crowd around got involved in it too. And they said, dirty Jew, filthy Jew. And Stefania watched that and she went back to the grocery store. She went, she went into a bathroom, she locked the door and she just stood there and looked in the mirror. And she looked at her skin and she described how she touched the skin of her cheek. She touched the skin of her hand. And right then she made a decision. And what she decided was that her Catholic skin was absolutely no different than Jewish skin. And that was also not a very usual idea for the time and place that Stefania lived. But that is what she decided. And that turned out to be later a big choice. So Stefania really uh, became part of the Diamant family. Um, they loved her like a daughter. She loved them like her family. She even lived with them for a while and everything was going well. Everything was, was good until September of 1939 when Hitler invaded Poland and bombs dropped on Shemesh. Um, this was surprising. Um, I don't think any of them knew it was coming. Um, it was devastating. And for a long time, the fighting went back and forth between the Germans and then the Russians who had come from the other side. And so these battles went back and forth the Russians took control, the Germans took control, and then the Russians took control of one side of Shemish and the Germans took control of the other side. So it was a split city. And luckily for Stefania, 
and the Diamant family, they were on the Russian side until 1941 when the Germans pushed through and took all of the city. And that is when the synagogues began to burn and that is when all of the Jews of Shemesh, including the Diamant family, were rounded up and put into ghettos. Now, if you're not familiar with what a ghetto is, it's really almost like a prison within a city. So it's a fenced off area um, of the city that uh, you cannot get in and out of without uh, checking in with guards um, and inside the ghetto, there was really, there was no work. There was very little food. Uh, people were starving. Um, they were being shot. It was, it was a horrific, horrific situation. And Stefania, who was Catholic, was not in the ghetto. She was left alone on the other side because the Diamant family had all been taken. So she was left uh, with no money, no job, um, trying to find food to sneak under the fences of the ghetto so that the Diamonds would not starve. And it was a pretty dire situation. And then St Stefania discovered that not only had the Diamonds been taken, but her mother and her brother had also been taken by the Germans um, to be Polish slave labor in the factories in Germany. And that meant that Stefania's littlest sister um, had been left on her own. So Stefania went and got Helena, her little sister, um, and brought her back to Shemesh. And so now Stefania is 16 years old. She is alone in a Nazi occupied city in Poland. She has the sole charge of a six year old sister. There is no job, no food, no money, no family, no anything. They are alone and destitute. And that is when in the middle of the night comes a knock on the door. And on the other side of the door, on the other side of that door is Max Diamant. And these are Max's identification papers. So this is what uh, the Germans would give out to everyone. You can see that uh, Max is marked here as a Jew so that everyone would know who you were. And Max is standing on the other side of the door and he is broken and he's bloody because he has just jumped off a moving train that was taking him to a death camp. So there were different kinds of concentration camps that Jews would be herded onto trains from the ghettos um, and taken to. Some of these camps um, were for work. They would work you until you died actually. Um, but some of these camps um, were like the camp he was being taken to, um, which was really just a machine for death. Um, basically, the trains would arrive, the people would be unloaded, and within two hours, thousands of people would be dead. And this had already happened to his parents. Um, he knew exactly what was coming. And so Max Diamant decided that he would rather take his chances and jump. So he got the people inside the train to push him up towards a tiny little window in the top of the cattle car where he squeezed through and, and jumped off. And he really thought he would die, only he didn't die. He survived and he went to the only person that he knew of that could possibly help him. And that was Stefania Podgorska. So now, Stefania and Helena have an enormous decision to make. They know exactly what happens to people who try to help Jews. So just the month before, um, a family right up the block from where Stefania lived um, had been caught hiding Jews and the entire family had been shot. She saw it. Um, they had hung people in the town square for aiding or feeding or helping Jews. She knew exactly what the risk was, but she and Helena decided to say, yes, yes, we will hide you. 
So they hid Max. And eventually they also hid Max's only surviving brother and then his brother's fiance. And then there was really no room. So Stefania had to find another place to stay. So she found this little cottage on Tatarska Street that had an attic where they could build a false wall for the people, for the Jewish people she was hiding so they could hide behind this false wall in the attic. And eventually she had 13 Jews hiding in her attic and she was struggling to feed them on the two ration cards that she had for herself and her sister. Um, and it was a very, very dire situation. Um, the cottage was attached. There was another house um, beyond the other wall of the attic and there was a Nazi officer living there uh, for quite some time because it was related to the people who lived next door. So. It was a very dangerous, difficult situation. And then came another knock on the door. And this time on the other side of the door, it's the Gestapo. It's two Nazi officers. And they say, we are requisitioning your house for staff quarters for the new German hospital that's being put in across the street. And basically we're moving in and you have to leave. Now, Stefania and Helena both knew that if they left, that the 13 people hidden in their attic were going to die, and they were going to die too. And they decided not to leave. It was a difficult choice, and it was an enormous choice. And when the Nazi officers came back and they hadn't left, they said, you know what, actually, it's really okay that you didn't leave because we don't need as much room as we thought. We, we're only gonna take the one bedroom. So four Nazi officers moved in to the bedroom. And now we have a situation where we have a 16 year old girl, her six year old sister. There are 13 people hidden in an attic directly above the bedroom where four Nazis are sleeping every night. And I am sitting there on my couch, riveted by this story. I couldn't move because what happened next, what she was telling me through my television screen was one of the most amazing stories of courage, bravery, sacrifice, just humanity that I had ever ever heard. And that day, Stefania Podgorska became my hero. I really wanted to believe that if I was put in that situation, that maybe I could do just a little bit of what she had done. But she was my hero. And I never forgot her story. Not for 23 years did I forget her story. And so now, fast forward through time, suddenly it's 2017, I'm an author, I have books on the shelves, um, I had five published books at that, at that time, um, and times have changed, right? There's, I, have the, I have tools like Google, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to look for Stefania Podgorska. I'm going to try to find her. What happened to her? What happened? And so I started searching. I started looking. I started looking for articles, all those things that you do when, when you're a researcher. And I found the end of her story. And the end of her story was that she married one of the men that she saved, Max Demont. And they had um, eventually immigrated to the United States and changed their name to Bursminski, even after the war, it was um, difficult to have a Jewish name. You could still be targeted um, for persecution because of your name. Um, so they changed their name to Bursminski and they had a son, a son named Ed Bursminski. So I reached out and I contacted Ed and I said, hey, what would you think about someone writing a book about your mom, because there have been there have been um, other things written, but not a not a fictional story, not a historical fictional fiction story. And he was really open to the idea, and he was very nice to me. So I went out, I met him, I met his family, and he took me 
to meet Stefania Pogorska. So she was in the last year of her life at this point. She had dementia. So she never knew that she met me, but I will never, ever, ever forget meeting her. Because how many people in the course of your life, how many of us will ever have the opportunity to sit at the feet of your hero? And she was my hero. She had been for years. So I sat in her presence and she would even, even then in her nineties, you know, with, with dementia, she sat straight up, her skin was smooth and she just had such a presence, um, so much strength. It was an, it was an amazing experience. And um, I started writing, I started a little bit writing the book and very soon afterwards, Stefania passed away. And I did get the privilege of being able to speak at her funeral. I got to help write her obituary, which was just such a huge honor. Um, and three weeks after um, Stefania passed away, Ed and my husband and I, we all got on a plane and we went to Poland to rediscover Stefania's life. So we went to Shemish. Um, this is what Shemish looks like right now. Um, we're close to right now. Um, it's a very small city. You know, I was surprised at how small it was because of the way Stefania um, described it. Um, it's a city with a lot of cathedrals. Um, and we walked all those streets. We walked where Stefania and Max walked, where Helena walked. Um, we looked and searched for all the places. We went to the archives and looked for um, where the tool factory, where she had worked for the Germans to try to earn money, for the Diamant's grocery store, you know, all of those places. And we went to Tatarska Street. Um, so this is Tatarska Street, um, where she hid 13 people in the attic and on the one side um, here you can see the front of the house they lived in the back of the house which you can see on the left hand side and if you look um, there's two little tiny windows across the top and that dark window to the side that is the window that was looking into the hidden part of the attic and this is a picture of Stefania in the attic um, and this was taken in the 1980s and um, you can see um, if you look just past the cameraman, there's sort of a line up the wall. And that's where the false wall went across the attic, looking like the attic stopped when it really didn't, when there was this space behind it. And this is looking into that space. So this is the space where 13 people had to spend all their time. And it's very small. Um, you can't really stand up. It was so small, in fact, that um, the, the people hidden inside had to all lay down on the floor in one direction, because if somebody needed to turn over, they all had to turn over. And it was sweltering in the summer. It was freezing in the winter. It was really a horrible place to be. And you had to exist there in absolute silence because of the people that were right below. You could not cough, you could not snore, you could not sneeze, you really couldn't move. It, it, was, it was horrific and it was very difficult to get food to them, to sneak food up, to sneak out a waste bucket. Um, that was mostly Helena's job. And I, I just, standing in that space, it was amazing to me that anyone survived it. It, it really, it really was. We went to the ghetto um, of Shemesh, what had used to be the ghetto. Um, and this across this street that you see here, that's where there would have been concrete barricades and barbed wire. Um, that was the main entrance to the ghetto. And that is what kept all the people um, inside until they had all been shipped away. We found the building where the Diamants had lived in the ghetto. We found a basement um, where Max hid. If you look on the ground there to the right, that little window below the big one, um, that is the window where Max hid in a basement to try to keep from being deported to, to the death camp and where he saw people dying out that window. We also went to a place in the ghetto. Um, this is a place that's now a memorial where 1,500 Jewish women and children were shot um, when there was not room for them on the trains. 
It was a horrible place to be. And we even went out, drove out into the country and we found the curve and the railroad tracks where Max Diamant jumped from a moving train. And that's Ed walking the tracks where his dad jumped off the train. Um, we were able to visit people who had been in the attic. This is Stefania with Jusha, um, who is in the book. And she was a child um, that, that survived the attic. And um, we went and visited with, visited with her in her house. Um, and she told me firsthand what it was like to live there, to be silent, what it was like to have to be so still and silent while rats ran back and forth across your body. Um, Wow. <laughs> um, I also got to go visit Helena, um, the little sister. She remained in Poland um, and, and stayed there and became a doctor. And she was just as much my hero as, as Stefania was. She, she did things no child should have to do. And this is her telling me her memories. And I will be so grateful for her giving me uh, those memories because they were incredibly difficult uh, for her to share. They were still very, very hard, but she was and is just an incredible woman. And I admire her. I admire her so much. I think one of my favorite stories that she told me um, while we were interviewing her is how she had been recruited when, when the Diamonds were in the ghetto, she had been recruited to pass notes back and forth um, to Max under the fence because who would suspect a child you know, of doing anything? So she would go pretend to play and take a note from Max. Well, one day the Nazi guard that was standing in that place where I showed you the picture in front of the uh, concrete barriers, the Nazi guard um, saw her take the note and he grabbed her and he started beating her. And you know what she did? She bit him in the leg hard, really hard, hard enough to make him let her go. And then she ran and while he was chasing her, she ate the note. That's what kind of incredible person she was even as a child. You don't get to meet many people who have been a Nazi. So I came back from this trip uh, to Poland, um, not the same person that I went in. And I came back from this trip, you know, I thought I had wanted to write one kind of book and I came back really realizing that I wanted to write another. Um, you know, I told you I'm a history buff. So even before I thought about writing this book, you know, I knew a lot about World War II. I knew a lot about the Holocaust. I had spent hours listening to the interviews of survivors um, and reading Hitler's speeches, you know, all, all of those things. I knew what happened in the camps. Let me tell you, when you go and you stand in those places where people have been murdered, when you stand in the gas chambers of Auschwitz, which will probably always, always stink, I stood there and I realized, you know what? I didn't know anything about the Holocaust. I knew lots and lots of facts, but I had not felt it. Not the way that I really, really needed to feel it. Because I think I understand now that, you know, when you know some facts, those things will fade away. You'll forget facts eventually. But when you feel something, that's when you never ever forget it. And what happened during World War II, during the Holocaust, what happened to people like the Diamant family? What happened with Stefania and Helena Podgorska? These are things we should never, ever, ever forget. And that's why I think it's really important to have books like The Light in Hidden Places, not because nonfiction isn't awesome, which it is, because I read it all the time, but I think it's important to have these kinds of books that are in a story so that we can walk in these people's shoes, so we can walk with Stefania and, and feel the weight of each decision that she had to make. And when we feel that, that's when it really makes a difference. And it challenges us 
she challenged me. And I think she's still challenging people through her story and hopefully, hopefully through this book, because these books are not just about the past, right? The hate that caused the Holocaust and that caused all of these terrible things to happen to the Diamant family and to Stefania and Helena, that hate did not die when Hitler died. It is alive and it is well all over the world and in many different forms. So when we read a story like this, we can say, what would I do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do when I am faced with the hate, the same hate that Stefania and Helena Podgorska faced? And you know, the thing is, Stefania Podgorska was just an ordinary person, right? She was just a teenage girl who was in, from this backwater part of Poland. Nobody that anybody would think was important. She was just normal, but she was a normal person who made a decision that started with a small decision that her skin was no different than another person's skin. And that set up another decision where she said, yes, I will hide you. And the next decision where she said, yes, I will hide you and you, and I will risk my life to save you because that is the right thing to do. And those decisions, starting with that little decision that happened, those decisions, they changed the world. They changed the lives of 13 people and their children and their grandchildren. And so if Stefania Pogorska, the ordinary girl, if her decisions changed the world, then don't our decisions, we're just ordinary people living our ordinary lives, but don't our decisions have that same potential? I think they do. And that's why I hope that you guys all read this book and you have a chance to think about that and to just know what she did and feel the gratitude that um, we should feel towards the people who did try to help and risk everything to help. And to remember that we can never let anything like this ever, ever happen again. So thank you so much for, for listening to me. And I think we're gonna do questions. Yes, indeed. And I, I made myself cry, I'm sorry. But I just, it's so important to me. It's an incredibly powerful story and I wanna thank you for sharing it with us in addition to talking about your book, but these individual stories are such important reminders, not only of the strength of human will, um, mm -hmm. but also just a reminder of the humanity behind these large-scale events that we study like the holocaust it's comprised of all of these lives these individual lives and the remarkable stories that come out of that yes seem to be endless so thank you very much for sharing this particular story and we do have a few questions that we're going to get into uh, we have i believe uh around 20 or so minutes uh to discuss this book in more detail um we have a few questions about the writing process more broadly speaking sure one question from Philip. Uh, did anyone ever doubt you uh, as you entered your journey into writing? Uh, if so, uh, did it impact you or um, how did you overcome any criticism you may have encountered? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I think that's a really important que question because absolutely any time that, um, that you start on a journey like this, especially something creative, especially something so different, you know, than anything else you've done before. Yes, people are going to doubt you. That is going to happen. Um, but I think the most important person that that doubt comes from is yourself. Um, and I don't know any writer that does not experience self-doubt on a daily basis. <laughs> um, it, is the, it is the thing you have to deal with all the time. And people think, oh, you know, you're a published author, so you must know that you can write books. And you know, the weird thing is, no, you don't know that you can write books just because you've published books. Um, you don't know that. There's always something inside you that says, maybe that was sort of, uh, you know, kind of like what I said, an accident before. <laughs> maybe that was just an accident. Maybe that was a fluke. Maybe I can't actually really do this. Or maybe this will be the one that's really, really bad. Or you tell yourself these things all the time. And I think we all do this to ourselves it, with any pursuit, but especially um, with, with creative pursuits. And learning to deal with that 
And learning to deal with that inner voice of doubt is sort of 101 to learning to become a writer um, or any creative person. Um, you have to learn to, to not listen to the extent that it stops you. You know, and sometimes a little bit of doubt is good, right? It makes you question yourself and you should never stop questioning, but you have to have enough um, confidence to move forward. And I think surrounding yourself deliberately with people who will support you in your endeavors um, helps a lot. And I did that and it was, it was an incredible thing for me, but it's still something we all deal with every day. That's very true. Imposter syndrome is a fickle beast. Um, <laughs> I've got another question from Barbara asking, so th this story focuses on young individuals. Uh, what happened to their parents? Did they survive the war? Yes, um, so Stefania's father had actually died before the war happened, um, but all of her family did actually survive. Her mother and her father um, did survive the, the slave labor camps. Um, but they were really not okay with what she and Helena did during the war um, with saving Jews. They did not agree with that and basically disowned both of them, which is a tragedy, really. Um, it was very difficult for them. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a question from Phil asking, historical fiction versus nonfiction, how did you decide which way to go with your books? Yes, um, and I, t I touched on that a little bit at the end, and, I, and this means a lot to me, so I'm really glad to expand on it. Um, I, you know, growing up, um, story was incredibly important to me. You know, I, I can't believe I never thought of being a writer because I was such a reader. Um, and what I really realized is that, ironically, it's through fiction that we learn our truth. And I think that is just an absolute truth of life. We are set up as humans to respond to story. And so while I love nonfiction and I read it all the time um, and I use it for reference and, and, I, and I love it, I have a whole bunch of it behind me right now. Um, I, I love nonfiction, but I think, it's, I think it's that fiction, it's that story that allows us to tap in to the lives of someone else, to put ourselves in that person's place. Um, and that's where we get empathy. That's where the empathy comes from, when, when we can understand another person enough to put ourselves inside their lives and ask ourselves, what would I do in this circumstance? And that empathy is something that this world is crying out for. Um, so I absolutely, um, well, I would never knock nonfiction non for me. Uh, my goal is to bring fiction into the world that allows people to do those things, hopefully, and to, and to find those truths for themselves. You know, we don't all find the same truth within a book. Um, you know, we, we find it according to ourselves. And that's one of the cool things about, about story and literature. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we've got another question here from Philip. Um, I know that in discussing this book, in this presentation, you, you said, you know, you got a little emotional talking about it, uh, mm -hmm. recounting the events of this book. Uh, but Philip is wondering if there's a particular part of the book or a scene in the book that hits especially hard for you or maybe hard for you to discuss more than others, given the subject matter. Um, I think there were a lot of things. I, let me answer this question this way. Um, everything that happens <clears throat> in the light and hidden places is based on something that really happened. Um, so in the author's note, I made three adjustments to a timeline. Um, and so I, I put those things in the author's note so people would know. Um, one of the things I was able to use for my research um, that Ed Brzezminski shared with me was his mother's unpublished memoir um, that she had written many years before, um, detailing her experiences during the war. And 
So everything that happens in the book, that, that was the backbone of the book. I pulled from there and I also pulled um, from other people's experiences that had lived in Shemesh um, and, and then the broader story of World War II. And I put all of that together to create the book, but the things that happened in there happened. However, I couldn't write everything that happened. Um, there were there were other things um, that were either quite personal um, or that the family said we'd prefer you did not share that or that were really part of someone else's story and not Stefania's um, that I didn't put in. And some of the things that I didn't put in, I think um, some of those things are quite painful, quite painful. But as far as what is in the book, um, I think still maybe the hardest moment for me is when Stefania allows herself to be experimented on medically um, in order to keep her job, in order to not be deported, in order to save those people. And it really was just the ultimate sacrifice um, that she could make other than totally giving over her life. And I think that part of the story still just it, it's it's hard it, it was hard to write and it's hard to think about now uh kathy asks um that they've noted there's been a number of books coming out recently about life during world war ii mm -hmm. um and Kathy's asking, why do you think that's happening? And do you think there's a connection to the fact that we are losing more and more survivors each day? I do, I absolutely do. I mean, I think first of all, there, there's just, there's an incredible amount of interest in World War II, you know, as, as there should be. Um, it is such a defining moment um, in human history, it, it should be. But I think there's a lot of fascination with that time too. So, you know, people are gravitating towards those kinds of stories, but absolutely our, our primary resources are slipping away and they are almost gone. And so I think a lot of authors are maybe feeling like this is my last chance, you know, to, to speak to some of these people um, and to hear some of these uh, stories. And that's why I'm so grateful um, to museums, um, to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum for doing these oral history projects that brought Stefania's story to me in the first place and that completely changed my life um, because I heard it. Um, these stories are so important and that's why these places are so important to um, you're you're the keepers um, of those memories, and I and I appreciate you uh, incredibly. But but yes, I think I think that's exactly right. I think people gravitate towards these stories, but also it's a defining moment in our history, and the primary sources are almost gone. So yes, we're, a lot of us are are going there. I will say though that I think what I think what makes maybe Stefania and Helena's story a little bit different. Um, than other Holocaust stories is um, because the focus is on the rescuer um, rather than the rescued. And I love the stories of survival and we need we need to hear those. And, her, and their story is a story of survival as well. But I think there's such a challenge for us um, because of what they chose to do and what could we choose to do that, that I really liked that aspect of their story. Absolutely, it's a heroism and a multitude of uh, facets. So yes. thank you again for joining us. Um, thank you. To Sharon Cameron, please check out her book, The Light in Hidden Places. This is an incredible story. Uh, thank you to everybody for tuning in today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, through our uh, K-12 uh, Teachers Facebook page, or uh, you can contact us via email. Um, but I wanna just, send our thanks once more to author Sharon Cameron for joining us as we uh, mark this important time of remembrance. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. So from Dr. Kristen Burton and the World War II Media and Education Center, I want to wish you all a wonderful day and stay safe out there. Take care. Thank you.